few years back, I bit the bullet and left my cushy nine to five to open my food dream. It was a chance encounter with the Belgian patisserie that changed everything for me. It's our chance to hatch our plan B out of the corporate life. Arriba! Because I love food. Now, I'm sharing my favourite recipes and searching for other passionate people to tell me their stories. In tonight's episode, we visit an amazing vineyard, an old quarantine station turned retreat, meet two birds that don't fly, and ride a steam train that takes us back to the gold rush. Back in Melbourne, boy do I love it. The vibe is frenetic and humming. I have a question for you. What's cooler than two blokes brewing beer? I'll tell you what. How about two birds brewing beer and doing it well? Some say even better than the blokes. And you won't find this place in the heart of the CBD, but it is a very short drive or train ride. I'm greeted today by head brewer, Jane Lewis. Together with marketing and sales guru, Danielle Allen, they are Two Birds Brewing. We went behind the scenes to see how beer is made. One of the first things she shows me is the steaming, hot, mushy barley that shoots out of the silo after it gives its flavor to the water. A great thing about this mush is that renowned Brasserie Breads uses some of this in the production of their breads. And a local farmer comes and carts it away to be feed for his cows. Talk about a good recycling program. She was excited to show me how they are now able to brew, bottle and package their beers all at their own facilities to be sent to your local liquor stores throughout Australia in pretty and colourful packaging. I love a good beer and a clever name as well. And Jane is happy to talk about her creations and where they came up with the creative names. So Golden Ale was a beer I made with Danielle in mind. So it was the first beer that we um, that we released. Um, and yeah, I wanted to make something that she, I wanted to make her favorite beer effectively. I was like, I want to make something that she's going to love. Um, and for that, we wanted to have something that was really approachable, really easy drinking. Um, it's got a lot of nice kind of toasted malt, honey notes, really good citrus characters as well, um, stone fruit, all of that kind of stuff. So, wow. yeah. Okay. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, so bright and fresh. Yeah, and, very mm. easy drinking. Mm. Yeah. The next one I would love to try is the Sunset. Awesome. Because it sounds amazing. All of the descriptions on your website of your beers are phenomenal. The way that you describe, I'm not sure if it's yours or Danielle's imagination, but it's fantastic because when you read it, mm. you think, I know exactly how that beer is going to taste and it's it's really exciting. So. It makes me thirsty. I, I can <laughs> almost taste them when, when I'm reading them, so it's great. And that means I'm doing my job right, I think. You are. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So yeah, one of my favourite things about Sunset is that colour. It is like a sunset. <laughs> it's like a golden to red sunset. Yep. It was named after the, the sunsets that Danielle and I remember from growing up in Perth. It uses all of these really great um, kind of caramel biscuit malts with a little bit of a kind of a roasty character as well. And so you get all of those characters coming across in the beer and, and um, the hops we use, you get a, a lot of that citrus character as well and a bit of a tropical note and um, so good with like roast meats and everything like that. So oh, it pairs okay. really well with anything that's got a bit of caramelisation on it. And so it's actually really great with a burger. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> I was stoked to hear about the beer pairing well with certain foods, just like wine would be. Mmm, really smooth, quite creamy. Mmm, mm, it's lovely. Next up is a beer called Taco. And if you know me, you know that I love Mexican food. So what better to put in a thirst-quenching cerveza than that? Taking all of the inspiration from the best Mexican food, so that 
the coriander, we also um, zest the limes, wow. um, and then we use corn in the mash. So taking those three kind of great parts of, of Mexican and then putting it into a beer. That's incredible. Okay, so can I just ask you a really quick question about the brewing process yeah. um, when it comes to infusing flavours? Yes. Yeah. So the coriander, where does that come in? Yeah, so we actually add all of the ingredients at the same time as you would when you're cooking. So the corn goes into the mash so that it gets some, some heat on it. We actually add the lime to the kettle. Um, so also we get a little bit of, uh, of that extraction and then we also add some lime to the fermenter at which stage where it's actually kind of at about 18 to 20 degrees and that's where we add all of the coriander leaf as well. So it maintains all of that really fresh, zesty character that you want from, from those ingredients. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> it's so thirst quenching. It and, uh, is. Yeah. It is. It's fantastic. I, I can taste the lime right away. At Two Birds, you can come and have your fave in a schooner. Or, if you're a bit of a sipper and a taster, then you can have the tasting paddle where you can choose four different beers to compare and contrast. I chose to share the tasting paddle with the crew, and then I went for a schooner of taco, then a schooner of golden, then a schooner of sunset. Surely, this is where the magic happens. When I told the crew I wanted to go to a remote part of Tassie and find a hidden gem, I think we really hit the jackpot with this next feature. Queenstown, four and a half hours drive from Hobart on a long, winding road. Arriving there, you descend into a valley that's visible from the cliff road and it seems almost eerily frozen in time. So we're in Queenstown and I'm just about to board the West Coast Wilderness Railway. Here it comes. It's just about to take us to Double Barrel. We've got two carriages. We've got the Heritage carriage. We've got the Wilderness carriage. And we've got some complimentary tea, coffee, and champagne. And we're gonna have some fun. This is where you'll catch the gorgeous West Coast Wilderness Steam Train to another mining town called Double Barrel and see some incredible scenery and eat some delicious country fare along the way. I lovingly devoured their hot, fresh scones with tazzy jams and cream while sipping my sparkling wine and looking out from the back of the train. Depending on which route and train package you choose, the chef will prepare fresh hors d'oeuvres, piping hot soup and bread, and they can cater to any dietary needs. It's such a nostalgic journey, and it reminded me of my grandpa. He was so obsessed with steam trains that he had a whole room dedicated to them and the town that he built for them, Anvil. I got lost in my reverie and imagined what it would be like for the men and women who worked and lived their lives around this rail line. I took the chance to mingle and talk with the other passengers and they were just as excited and awed by the history and the engineering that went into building something this impressive back then. There were a few stops along the way to stretch your legs and learn about the local area. I was even lucky enough to be able to visit the engine room and see all of the gauges and the fire.
and what goes up must come down. Well, must be manually turned around by the train staff so we could return back to whence we came. The Queenstown to Double Barrel Route takes you through farmland, rainforest, deep gorges, and gold mining towns for a little gold panning. I did try my hand at it, and although I didn't find any real nuggets in the water, I am truly taking this gem of a memory and keeping it very close to my heart. In Australia, when we talk pies, we mean meat pies. In America, it's generally sweet dessert pies. Today, I'm making a real favourite of ours at the Cakery. This is my Express's Best recipe for Mile High Granny Smith Apple Pie. Have your dry ingredients in a bowl. Add your cold, cubed butter and shortening. And get in there with your fingers and squeeze the fats into the flour until it looks like small peas and sand. It's okay that there's a few lumps of fat left because that will add to the flaky layers for your pie. Add some, but not all, of your iced water and mix it up until it just comes together. Wrap the dough in plastic and chill for at least 30 minutes. Put your dough on the table and press it flat. Then roll it out to a fairly thin round sheet. Today's awesome tip, take your pie dough and roll it onto your rolling pin and then lay it over your pie dish Trim the dough to the rim of your pie dish, then take the leftovers and roll it out again. Take a knife, or what I'm using, which is a pastry wheel, and cut strips of dough and chill both the base and the strips until you finish with your fillings. What a cool contraption, an apple core. It peels, slices and cores at the same time. Cut them into quarters and add the juice of one lemon. Now it's spice time. Cinnamon, mixed spices and sugar. Then use your fingers to lift and combine the flavours together. Fill your pie base with as much apple as you can and then lay the strips of dough in a crisscross pattern. There's a fancy way to do it in a traditional proper lattice weave, but I'm going to keep it simple and do it all one direction first and then go back and do my cross direction. Glue your strips down with egg wash and give it another coat to stick the raw sugar to. This pie is going to have a crunchy, sweet, flaky pastry that will stand up to the coldest of ice creams. Bake in a preheated 180 degrees Celsius oven for 40 minutes or until golden brown. This morning is a glorious day, so I thought what better way to go across to the other side of the hub of the hidden gems. I'm catching the Manly Fast Ferry from Circular Quay. It's an Australian owned and run company that ferries commuters all around Sydney Harbour. I've taken the Eco Hopper. It's the blue and yellow line that stops in suburbs like Rose Bay, Watson's Bay and Manly. And it's the only commercial ferry service that will take me to Q Station, one of the most hidden gems that has been right in front of our nose the whole time. Departing from Circular Quay, I always feel nostalgic because I grew up half my life here and I feel extremely lucky for that. The harbour is accessible to everyone. It's affordable and this is definitely the most enjoyable way to skip that horrible Sydney traffic 
and glide on by. On my mission to meet passionate foodies, I got to talk with the skipper, who was also quite chuffed about his daily grind. Can you blame him? Oh, I was working away for a lot of years and the opportunity came up to work on Sydney Harbour and I just had to take it. Of course, why wouldn't you? It's the most gorgeous harbour in the world, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a pretty good workplace, that's for sure. Yeah, this is like a dream job. Oh, it certainly is, yeah. Like, where else would you want to be working? I do believe that this is my stop. Thanks for the lift, Eco Hopper. I'll see you on the way back. Walking from the pier, I'm just absolutely gobsmacked by how beautiful this entrance to my next destination is. You really do have to say that this is God's country. Q is for quarantine. It's hard to imagine that I'm visiting what was once the main quarantine station for any ill or contaminated boats that first arrived in Sydney Harbour back in the 1800s. I met with David who happily showed me around the accommodation and shared his knowledge. Hi Jill, how are you going? Very good, thanks. Thanks for agreeing to meet me. My pleasure. Welcome to Q Station. Going? Yeah. Situated on the north head of Manly and within Sydney Harbour National Park, you can quite easily forget that you're still right in the heart of Sydney. This is a very special part of our history that has been well fostered and kept in pristine original condition, although some of the amenities are much improved. If you're looking for a unique experience, Q Station can provide it. In addition to the accommodation, they offer beautiful venues for weddings, walking paths to go bush, scary ghost tours, conference space, restaurants, and stairs. Lots of stairs. We took the stairs down to the Boiler House restaurant on the shore where it's nestled between bush and beach. This is where I met head chef James Green, who is renowned for making art, on a plate. Well, it's nice to meet you, James. Yeah, you too. We made and tasted some ridiculously good looking dishes this afternoon. But the idea is to make it look a little bit like a beach kind of scene with the, um, the couscous kind of resembling a little bit of sand. Being right next door to the beach, it's kind of easy to get that kind of inspiration. Absolutely. So, so you can see the sort of sand texture we have there. We're just going to finish it with the, the leek ash to give it a little bit of smoky flavour. Wow. What is leek ash? Uh, so we just take leek and quite literally just burn it and then powder it. So it still takes on a nice flavour of, of the leek but it's just got a smoky character that just goes really nicely with the, um, the scallops. And then we have some ice plant here and then we're just going to finish it with the salmon roe. That's the dish. That looks amazing. Pan-seared scallops with cauliflower couscous, a sprinkling of burnt leek ash and salmon roe. Take a good look folks because I'm about to perform some magic and make it disappear. Beautiful. Thank you very much. The texture of that scallop is incredible. And then you've got the salty pop of the roe as well, so it's, just, it's really nice textural clean flavour. For the main course we did a slow roasted Angus beef short rib with a sticky delectable sauce, smoked eggplant and topped with grated horseradish and mustard leaves. What an amazing combination. So delicious. And that Angus beef was so tender and juicy. Then, on to the dessert and we Jackson Pollocked the plate. James was the teacher and I was the student. I tried my best and I splattered my white blouse, but I continued with the chocolate parfait, the berries and an earth-shattering honeycomb. I couldn't resist using James micro tweezers. 
I just had to get the microherbs placed just so. I thought James deserved a nice relaxing sit down with some wine, so we took our dessert and sat in the courtyard. I learnt a little bit about James and how special his childhood was growing up in Lord Howe Island of all amazing places. The dessert was a delightful mix of sensual smooth chocolate and pert tart berries, finished off by a crescendo of shattering honeycomb. Oh, my word, actually I've got none except yum. Located in New South Wales, about halfway between Sydney and Brisbane, Bago Vineyards and Mays is an easy drive from either capital on the Pacific Highway. The winery and cellar door overlook the Mays, making it an ideal spot to sit and take in the scenery and see something utterly amazing. Jim Mobbs, owner of Bago Vineyards, greeted me at the cellar door for a quick wine tasting and a chat. Jim, you have a great place here. Can you tell me a little bit about it? It's really in the middle of nowhere, but it's very close to everything. It's like, we've got state forest all the way around us and then national park. So you have to come through a lot of bush and country to get to us and then it just opens up. And it was originally dairy farming. Oh. And then we've been here about, oh, 40 or 50 years, but not always growing grapes. And it wasn't until the mid 80s that they realized they could grow grapes in the microclimate that this unique area provided. You can't expect everybody to like the same wines and that's what makes the whole industry uh, really good because some people like certain styles, other people uh, aren't sweet enough, too sweet. I'm willing to give them all a try. <laughs> you might have to get some transport for your home. <laughs> Generally, we start off on a, a bubbly, so would you like to try a bubbly? You look like a bubbly girl. I am a bubbly girl. I'm a very bubbly girl. Okay, so this is... But I like bubbly too, so... We started with sparkling white. Of course, my fave to wet my appetite and wake up my taste buds. Then, a still red and ended with a bubbly red. Beautiful. So this, this is probably one of our um, flagship wines. Traditionally it's a Christmas day drink because it's a spark, a cold red on a Christmas day. Lovely. The colour was such a beautiful, vibrant, popping, hot pink in the light. And I could imagine that this would be great and refreshing on a hot Christmas day. After the tasting, I was completely sober enough to tour the storeroom where he showed me his barrel collection and told me about the awards that they've won. So they keep their reds in oak barrels to impart flavour into the wines, but they choose stainless steel silos for the whites because they don't want to impart the flavour of the oaks. Clever. Okay, I'm always up for an adventure, so I hopped on the back of the ATV with Jim. Glad I wasn't driving, I'm just saying. And Jim made a joke of it too. Ugh, how dare he? He took me to meet Som, who runs his fruit and vegetable gardens in the back of the winery. She picked everything that was ripe and ready for me. But since it was winter, the patches were a little bare, but the raspberries were a welcome little treat. Oh, wow. Why have the birds not stolen these? Probably they leave it for you, that's why. <laughs> I tried the crispy kale, beetroot leaves. They're quite nice. Mmm, yeah. very nice. And got the classic pull the beetroot out of the dirt GoPro shot. You can even juice this beetroot. Jim showed me his experimental rose of an American grape variety called Norton. It's naturally disease resistant. Yeah, it's like a hedgerow running up here between these rows. You can't actually get through them in the middle of the, the summer when they're growing. So. so 
that's almost like your maze. It is a bit like the maze. It's, oh. uh, perhaps the maze might be a little bit harder. This is in one straight line. <laughs> this is probably all I can handle, but let's go and see how I do. Okay, we'll go and see if uh, you can get into it first and then <laughs> see if you can get out of it. <laughs> It's a really cool thing to do with the family on the weekends. You can, the adults can have the wine and the kids can go through the maze and then the adults can follow and try to find the children in the maze. Well, quite often we just where we're standing, we get lots of people picnicking here under the trees, just watching what's going on down there. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful vista. It really is gorgeous. So we started planting on Christmas day, 2006. I specifically got all the children home Christmas day and we did a bit of work and actually planted some plants so we can always remember when we started. Oh wow. Well, I think I'm going to go get lost. You can get lost? I didn't expect him to agree with me, but I'm sure he meant it in the nicest possible way. La 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 la, music! spy with my little eye. La, 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 la. Okay, I surrender. You can come get me now. Jim? Jim? Okay, where am I? But somehow I ended up in the same spot. Skip to the loop, my darling. Really? Where's the loop? I finally made it out. I may suggest that the maze comes before the wine tasting next time. Hello? Guys? I wish I could say oh, that beautifully. Just mouth the words and say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and action. <laughs>